Okay, good morning, everyone, uh, and welcome to this week's virtual plant clinic. My name is Bill Lester. I'm with University of Florida Extension Service here in beautiful Hernando County, Florida. And today, you're going to have just me here because let me make a few clicks here. And uh, we have a little technical problem here. It looks like uh, we are probably not live today on one of our Facebook pages, but that's okay. Hopefully we're live somewhere and somebody will be tuning in today and asking a question or two. So, um, Okay, there we go. I think I fixed it to a certain extent. Uh, technology, isn't it great? So this morning, you have just me here because my regular co-host, Lily Browning, is on vacation this week. So Lily is not here with us, but I'm here. If anybody has any questions, please go ahead and put them in the chat. Uh, I have a, just a couple things to share, a few things that people have asked me about this past week. And um, the first one is, got a phone call and an email from a lady who is having a problem with her shrubs. And I even have a picture that she sent me that I can go ahead and share. So let me go ahead and do that. There we go, she sent me a picture of her um, viburnums and she has a viburnum hedge and some of the newer plants that she had planted just a few years ago to extend the hedge, to make it longer and fuller, are not looking really good. And they have some yellowing leaves on them. And normally when somebody sends me an email with good pictures, nine times out of 10, we can give them an idea of what's wrong and what to do to fix it and give them some advice. In this case, I looked at that and that could be a couple of different things. It may be spider mites or some other kind of insect problem. She said she checked for insects, but spider mites are extremely small. And we do have a microscope here at our office. So I told her she could bring a sample by. We double check it under the microscope to see if it looks like a fungal disease or spider mites. But there's a very good chance that the plants just need to be fertilized. And I told her if she fertilizes them very, very lightly, once a month and as soon as the regular rains start in now that we're up into warm weather season viburnums are going to take off and grow like crazy viburnum hedges tend to grow like weeds all summer long as a matter of fact they can become a problem because if you have to keep it trimmed to a certain size they grow so quickly it seems like you're out there every month or every couple of weeks having to prune them to keep them looking good but um, I told her that her bushes should be just fine. If she could bring a sample by that we could double check for an insect or disease problem, we can you know, either rule that in or rule it out. Then other than that, uh, light fertilization with um, a 666 or 101010 general purpose um, landscape fertilizer should work just fine. Buddy, good morning. We have at least somebody tuning in here watching me by my lonely self here today. Um, so that was one question that I got this past week and let's see what else I was asked about turf questions. Oh my gosh. We get turf questions pretty much year round, but certain times of the year, we get even more turf grass questions than other times of the year. And a lot of people it really depends on exactly what kind of lawn you have. So whether you have a St. Augustine lawn or a Bahia lawn or a gentleman came in the office who actually had a Zoysia lawn. I know Zoysia is very popular in certain areas. Here in Hernando County, we have very few people with Zoysia lawns. I know a few years ago, many people switched to Zoysia because it was kind of touted as not really a perfect turf grass, but a very, very easy to grow and manage turf grass. 
it's going to look fine, has almost no disease or pest problems. Well, they weren't quite right on that. Zoysia can be very, very difficult to manage if you don't know what you're doing. If you read up on it and you cut it at the right height, you fertilize it just properly, you're able to look out for the uh, insect pest, which is a hunting bill bug, kind of a strange name. It's a little, very, very, very tiny beetle that causes problems with zoysia grass. I've never seen one myself, and I had, don't have one in my collection because we have so few zoysia lawns and we very rarely get zoysia questions here. But the gentleman had just had part of his lawn resodded. Uh, company brought out the sod. He paid somebody else to throw the sod down. He went on vacation for six days, came home, and it was all totally brown. So I told I know Zoysia can get really fussy. If it gets really, really dry, it will go dormant, no matter what time of year it is. And you're going to have to water it and be patient for it to come back out of dormancy and green up and start to grow. So I said, that's probably what his problem was. But of course, he had to ask because everybody seems to think, should I fertilize it? Is the problem with my grass the fact that it turned brown, the fact that it's dead, the fact that you know there's some kind of issue with it? Should I fertilize it? And I can tell you, it, fertilizing is almost never the answer to the problem. Everybody thinks watering and fertilizing is going to fix whatever the problem is. You really have to get to the bottom of the problem first, and more fertilizer is almost never the solution. So with this gentleman's zoysia lawn, I told him he needed to be patient. His section of turf may have gotten too dry and went into dormancy, so he needs to just water it normally, not overwater it, but water it as needed, and hopefully it will come out of dormancy and turn green and start to grow again. We do get a lot of questions about St. Augustine lawns, and people say, should I fertilize it? No, just your problem is almost never a lack of fertilizer. We have a lot of disease problems here in Hernando County with St. Augustine lawns. And the root of that problem, nine times out of 10, is poor management. People cut their grass too short. And a lot of people have services that they hire to cut their lawns. And they are notorious for cutting lawns too short. So you have to make sure they cut them at least four inches high. Don't just take their word for it. Go out in your yard, either after you cut it or after they cut it, and get yourself a ruler. I have a yardstick around my office somewhere that I you know, take when I have to go out and do yard visits. But go out there with a ruler and measure it. And those leaf blades should be a good four inches high. And four inches is going to be about this high. So it should be four inches from ground. This is where the dirt is. And this is where the top of the grass blade should be. And almost nobody's lawn that I look at is managed that high. Most of them, the top of the blade comes up about this, about two inches. And if you keep cutting your grass that short, it's going to kill it after about a year or two. But you're probably going to have problems with chinch bugs and diseases first. And that's what's going to take out your lawn. But it was caused by cutting it too short. And of course, Bahia grass, if it doesn't rain and you don't have irrigation, your lawn will turn totally brown. Mine turns totally brown every winter and spring, depending on how much rainfall we get. And as soon as it starts raining, boom, within 20 minutes, my lawn turns green. And within a day or two, all of a sudden it's grown and I have to go out there and cut it. And then it starts growing really fast and I have to go out every week, tops, and cut it because it's gonna get out of control if I don't. So uh, with Bahia grass, if it's really dry, it goes dormant, that's no, no problem. Your lawn might be totally brown, but it's not dead. It's gonna come back as soon as it rains or as soon as you water it. If you have an irrigation system of water it, that's gonna keep it green and growing. So if anybody watching has any questions, please feel free to go ahead and put them in a chat box and we'll We'll try to figure out an answer to your issue. Um, we have a few people on here watching us on YouTube today. So something else that just kills me. Every time I go on Facebook, I'm a member of a lot of different Facebook garden groups. And they range from the food forest group to growing edible crops 
to growing ornamentals, uh, Central Florida gardening. Uh, there's a Florida friendly gardening group on there. And every day somebody goes on there and asks a question and they all are basically the same. It's what does everybody use to control bugs in your garden? Something that's organic and non-toxic and safe and won't hurt anything. And that is the absolute wrong place to start because nine times out of 10, these people have absolutely, have really have no idea what their insect problem is or what their problem is. They go out and look at their garden, doesn't look right, leaves are brown, plants are dead, chunks are chewed out of the leaves. I don't know, there's some kind of problem going on out there and they figure it must be a bug. I have no idea if it's a bug or what kind of bug it is. I'll ask on Facebook what everybody uses that's totally safe to kill bugs. Well, bugs are not all created equally. We have a lot of different insects here in Florida, some of which are pests and some of which are good bugs. Hopefully everybody knows that ladybugs are good bugs because ladybugs eat aphids and they can eat spider mites, they eat mealybugs, they eat scales, they eat a lot of bad pest insects. So you don't want to kill the ladybugs. We have a lot of other insects that are good or they really don't hurt anything. I saw somebody ask on Facebook, what do I use to control bugs? that are eating all my plants, things like love bugs and ants and aphids and this and that. I'm thinking, love bugs? Love bugs don't damage your plants. Love bugs are not a plant or a garden pest. Love bugs are probably there, but they're not really bothering anything. Ants, ants are not bothering your plants. Ants may be there and they're an indication you have some other kind of pest. Things like aphids or mealybugs or scales, but ants in and of themselves are not eating up your tomatoes and peppers and cucumbers. You have other pests that are doing that. It's really important that you learn some basics about the different types of pests that you may possibly have and go out there and actually look for them and determine, aha, I know that I have an insect pest problem because I have tomatoes and I went to my garden and I turned the leaves over and I found great big caterpillars on my plants and they're chewing the leaves up. So I know what my problem is. It's a caterpillar. So maybe I can go on Facebook or contact me or your local county extension office and ask them, um, what do I use to control caterpillars on my tomato plants? I can answer that question. That's a really easy one to answer. The, what do I use to control bugs you know, mysterious bugs on plants, there's really no way that you could answer that. That's just, just way too vague. Who knows what kind of bugs you're dealing with? You're gonna use one thing for caterpillars, something else for aphids and spider mites and mealybugs, something totally different for beetles and leaf-footed bugs and stink bugs. I know of safe to use organic products. That's what we always recommend first but still you have to read the directions. Most of these products, you don't want to get them all over your hands or feet. You don't want to be breathing them in. You need to wear eye protection because when you're, there we go, when you're mixing these things up, you don't want any of them to splash back up into your face or your eyes or into your mouth. And even if they're safe and organic, you don't want to be consuming them. You still need to use protective equipment. So we can answer those kind of questions. It's just, I'm not sure what's worse, the people who ask, what do I use to control, you know, generic bugs in my garden, or the people that jump jump on there and start answering it, oh, use this, use that. And let's see, the number one answer is neem. Neem doesn't generally work very well. Sometimes it does, most of the times it doesn't. Diatomaceous earth, and there's very, very few things that diatomaceous earth or DE is effective on. Definitely doesn't work on everything, works on very, very few things. Insecticidal soap is going to work in most cases. Uh, horticultural oil works in most cases, but you don't want to use it during the summer when it's really sunny and hot. It might sunburn your plants if you spray it on them on a sunny day. And of course, something like BT or spinosad for caterpillars is going to work very, very well. But what you use for a caterpillar 
is probably not going to work well on a beetle or a stink bug. So very important. You need to know what kind of insect pests and problems you're dealing with before you start asking other people, what do you recommend or what do you use? Because you're going to get all kinds of wacky information out there. People are just going to give you every possibility in the world, some of which are correct, but a lot of which are not really correct. So like I said, anybody has any questions, just go ahead and uh, put them in the chat box there and we'll answer your questions. Other than that, today might be a fairly short session here. Um, those are really the only questions that I can think of that have come up over the last week. Let's go ahead and share a few things here. For our upcoming classes, you see the website scrolling down below there, the www.hernandoextension, all one word, .com. If you go there, that is going to have a complete listing of all of our upcoming classes. And I schedule classes, Lily schedules classes that should all be listed on there also. We have other people in our office that do classes. So we have a variety of different topics other than mine are primarily lawn and garden, as you know, Lily's are primarily Florida friendly landscape topics. We do have free classes on other topics. I think our Sea Grant agent, Brittany, has a class coming up, I noticed on there, Fish 101. So if anybody is interested in fish or fishing, she is our marine biologist, and she will explain to you how a fish works and how they do what they do out in the water. And of course, any fish-related or uh, saltwater-related questions you might have, she can answer all them. Um, I believe next week, Lily is supposed to be back, so we should have both myself and Lily here next week. But if you have any Florida-friendly landscape kind of questions, feel free to go ahead and email Lily. There's her email right there. So she may not be able to get to them right away until she comes back from vacation. I think she comes back next Wednesday, so she should be back just in time for next Thursday morning. And of course, the best way by far to get in touch with me is through email. And if you email me a question and send pictures, lots of pictures, ideally clear pictures, and pictures, if it's of a large plant, get pictures kind of far away, pictures up closer. And then if it's a small insect or leaf problem or something like that, really, really up close pictures, as up close as you can get and send a number of them to me, that really helps me to figure out what your problem might be. And if it's for um, a plant identification, if I'm not sure what it is, I send it off to University of Florida. And the more pictures, the better. The more pictures I'm able to send them, the better their identification is gonna be and the easier it is on them also. So a lot of times if you send just one kind of blurry picture, I might be emailing you back asking, can you send a few more to make it a little bit easier on us? But sending me an email with pictures is definitely the best way to get in contact with me. I'm here at the office today, but there's plenty of other times that I'm not at the office. I'm out in the field. I'm working remotely. So calling the office is generally not a really good way to get in touch. Um, instant Messenger through Facebook. I do get those, but it will usually take me a little bit of time to actually notice it, read it, and be able to respond to you. So email is by far the best way. Unfortunately, I got this thing here, and I can get my email on it. So I'm not going to tell you that I'm always connected and in touch, but some days it kind of feels like that. So... I don't see any other questions on here. I think we might have problems with um, broadcasting to one of our Facebook pages. But don't worry. We'll take the recording of this session here and put it back on our regular Facebook page. 
it does look like we're live on our Facebook group. So anybody who's a member of our Facebook group, good morning. And thank you so much for joining our group. I try to go in there and respond to as many questions as I can. Some days it's just a little hard to find the time. And also we are broadcasting live on YouTube. And YouTube is a great place to broadcast too, because as soon as I'm done, YouTube saves this session as a video. It adds closed captioning automatically. I really appreciate that because otherwise I have no idea how I would do it if they didn't do it for me and it gets saved as a video. So if you ever want to watch any past editions of this, go ahead and check on our Facebook page, check on our YouTube channel. Um, and we have them going back, gosh, well over two years now. I think we're probably coming up on the better part of two and a half years of almost weekly virtual plant clinics. You know, if Thursday falls on a Christmas day or New Year's day, sorry, Lily and I are probably taking the day off. And every once in a while between the two of us, either we're both on vacation or off of conferences and we have to skip a day. But I think that we've been on pretty much nine out of 10. Um, Thursdays, I'm going to have to sit down and count how many different views and participants we've had over the last two and a half years at this point to see how we're doing. I think I'll go ahead and count those numbers up this coming week. It takes a little time to count that much. But hey, everybody, thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, like I said, if you do have a last minute question, go ahead and get it in quick. Otherwise, please be sure to tune in, in again next Thursday morning. Uh, Lily and I should be back 10 o'clock next Thursday. Hopefully all the different Facebooks and YouTubes will work correctly. The technology will work correctly. It doesn't always, uh, but we always do our best to kind of work around it. And other than that, um, we will see you again next Thursday. And between now and then, if you have any questions, just shoot me an email. And we will do our very best to either answer it directly if it's a really easy question. If it's harder, I'll ask friends. Uh, emails are great because it makes it very easy for me to forward them to other people. And maybe they can help me figure it out. And if worse comes to worse, we have the entire University of Florida backing us up. And whatever your question's on, believe it or not, they have an expert in that area that we can send it to and get it answered and get you some recommendations, advice on what to do about it if it's a fixable problem. So, hey, everybody, thank you so much. And until next week, we will see you then. See you later. Take care. Bye.